My name is Tonya Moore. I'm a vascular technician working in a specialist vascular lab at Salford Royal Hospital. I want to talk about Raynaud's phenomenon, what it is, the difference between a primary and secondary condition, the investigations we do, and finally, the treatments are that are available. After my presentation, I'll be answering your questions from 12 to 1 p.m. via SRUK's Twitter. Raynaud's phenomenon, you may have heard of it as Raynaud's disease or Raynaud's syndrome is the term given to the vasoconstrictive response of the arteries to the trigger of cold or emotional stress, typically affecting the fingers and toes, but also extremities such as the nose, ears and lips may be affected. In the part affected, it will turn white, blue or red or a combination of these colours. Raynaud's describes the colour changes that occur in response to cold exposure, but this doesn't always have to be related to cold weather. Even on a warm day, the sun going behind a cloud or going into an air-conditioned building or walking past the chill dial in a supermarket can bring on the colour changes. Raynaud's symptoms may also be brought on by stress or anxiety. The symptoms of Raynaud's can occur in different parts of the hand but typically affect the knuckles to the tip of the fingers. It can happen in one or more fingers and one or both hands. The same goes for the feet or other extremities if they're involved. Sufferers can find the experience of having Raynaud's very distressing as it has an impact on many aspects of their daily living. What actually happens is the body's typical response to the cold but occurring in an exaggerated fashion and without the need for extreme temperatures to provoke the response. In those without Raynaud's, when the hands go into the freezer, the arteries that supply the fingertips constrict and the blood flow to the fingers is reduced. This is a normal response. The body does this in order to preserve the blood supply to the main organs, essential to the normal functioning of the body at the expense of the extremities. When the hands come out of the freezer, the blood vessels relax back to the normal size, the blood, vessel, the blood flow is restored, and the process occurs without bringing on a change in colour. In someone who has Raynaud's, it's not necessary to put your hands into the freezer to bring on that response. Just walking from one room to a slightly cooler one is enough to bring on colour changes as though the fingers have been exposed to freezing temperatures. The fingers will usually turn white or blue and eventually red when the fingers start to warm up. The diagnosis of Raynaud's phenomenon is made when the fingers demonstrate two or more colour changes in response to the cold. The cause of the colour changes are due to the arrangement of the blood vessels. The fingers are supplied by a network of blood vessels which travel all the way down each side of the finger. The flow of the blood through these vessels determines the colour of the fingers. When the fingers are exposed to the cold, if there's no blood in the finger, then the fingers will appear white. If there's blood trapped within the finger, the surrounding tissues take oxygen and the blood becomes deoxygenated and the fingers appear blue. As the fingers start to recover, the small arteries open up massively a wave of blood flow pushes around the fingers and they often become very red and start to tingle. This increase in blood flow is called a hyperemia and is often considered the most uncomfortable phase. So in general, the body's normal response to stress or cold is heightened during a Raynaud's attack, causing the colour changes and circulation effects that are much, much more extreme. Patients will usually go to their GP describing the colour changes that happen in their fingers. It may be something that started recently or something that's gone on most of their life. The GP may refer to a rheumatologist who will take a full history and description of the colour changes. A blood test to look for any factors responsible for the symptoms. And at Salford, patients will undergo vascular investigation, 
involving a nail fold capillary microscopy test looking at the smallest blood vessels in the finger and a thermal cold challenge test. It's important to do the test to decide if the condition has a primary or a secondary underlying cause. Primary Raynaud's phenomenon is a very common condition, typically affecting 5% of the population, these being mainly women. In general, the individual will have had the symptoms since their teens, and when blood tests are performed, there are no abnormalities. The nail fold capillary microscopy is within normal limits, and the cold challenge investigation demonstrates a primary pattern. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon is much, much rarer, with scleroderma affecting in the order of 30 per million of population. Again, it occurs more frequently in women, and in general, patients will have developed the symptoms of Raynaud's later in life. The blood test may show evidence of antibodies, and the nail fold capillary microscopy is often abnormal. And the cold challenge investigation demonstrates a secondary pattern. There can be different possible causes to secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, some of which have solutions, others which will require close follow-up. In simpler cases, some medications such as beta blockers, which are, called, which are used by cardiologists to control symptoms of arrhythmia, or which can be used to lower blood pressure, can occasionally cause symptoms of Raynaud's. By changing the treatment to one which acts in a different way, this may be enough to have some effect on the symptoms of Raynaud's. In conditions such as cryoglobulinemia, there's an increase in stickiness of the blood, making the passage down the tiny blood vessels very difficult. If the blood is thinned and the problem resolved, then it may be possible to affect the, the Raynaud's symptoms. The underlying cause may be industrial, for, in for example, exposure to chemicals such as vinyl chloride. Sometimes the Raynaud's may be due to the repetitive effect of using vibrating tools such as jackhammers, which can cause vibration white finger. If care is taken to limit the extent of exposure in future and personal protective equipment is used, this should limit the symptoms. Occasionally, the underlying cause of the secondary Raynaud's phenomenon may be connective tissue disease, such as scleroderma. Here, the process of fibrosis is the underlying cause, affecting the blood vessels and influencing the circulation. In this case, treatment can be given to address the symptoms of Raynaud's. It's important for your clinician to know whether the condition is primary or secondary, as that will dictate your future follow-up at the hospital. When the Raynaud's is primary, the clinician will usually discharge back to the care of the GP with advice about coping with the symptoms, potential treatments available, and no further follow-up. When the Raynaud's is secondary, then regular follow-up appointments to monitor the condition in clinic will be made, along with medication to treat the symptoms and advice regarding keeping warm. The clinician uses tests to provide information to help decide whether a patient has a primary or a secondary Raynaud's condition. Blood tests, including an ESR, an immunology screening test, check for underlying connective tissue disease. A microscope looking at the nail bed gives information about the size and shape of capillaries. And at Salford, a thermal examination and cold challenge test gives information about the response to different temperatures. Nail fold capillary microscopy enables a view of the tiniest blood vessels. This helps in the discrimination between a primary and a secondary condition. The finger is placed underneath the microscope and a drop of oil allows the capillaries to be visualized. The capillaries are close to the surface in the area of the cuticle at the edge of the nail, where it's possible to make out under magnification a row of capillary loops. 
Under normal circumstances and in primary Raynaud's phenomenon, the capillaries appear as a row of slim hairpin loops. It's not unusual for the loops to appear twisted, but there should be no gaps and no widened loops. In secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, the loops are fewer in number and the appearance is of a wider loop. In addition to this equipment, there are other cheaper and more portable models available. These can be used by the doctor to look at the nail fold capillaries in a clinic situation. Because we're interested in microvascular investigation here at Salford, we do a cold challenge test which uses a thermal imaging camera and takes place in a temperature controlled lab. We take a thermal image of the hands. The hands are cooled in water at 15 degrees for a period of one minute. This will not bring on a Raynaud's attack. The hands are observed for a period of 15 minutes with the thermal camera. Halfway through the test, we'd expect the hands without Raynaud's to have recovered their temperature. Those with primary Raynaud's to have shown a limited recovery with mainly the thumbs and little fingers being the warmest in this example. And those with secondary Raynaud's to, dis to demonstrate very little recovery. At the end of the 15 minutes recovery, we'd expect the hands without Raynaud's to, be, to continue to be fully rewarmed. The hands with primary Raynaud's to show a good recovery and those with secondary Raynaud's to continue to demonstrate very little recovery. The thermography testing gives us information about the temperature sensitivity to the cold, and along with the other investigations, helps in the decision between a primary and secondary Raynaud's condition. Lastly, I'm going to discuss the treatment of Raynaud's phenomenon. Usually, Raynaud's sufferers will have already made changes to their lifestyle to cope with their symptoms of Raynaud's phenomenon. It's important to remember that when the fingers become cool, they lose the sensitivity, so care must be taken not to cause damage whilst trying to warm them. It's not advisable to warm hands on a radiator or in hot water, as it's difficult to judge a safe temperature that won't do damage to the fingers as they start to warm up. Lifestyle modifications such as quitting smoking and taking decaffeinated drinks are beneficial in keeping the hands warmer as both nicotine and caffeine constrict the blood vessels. Exercise is great for increasing the circulation and keeping the body warm. The most simple of remedies is an awareness of the body's sensitivity to the cold using layers to keep the body core temperature warm where possible, it's helpful to avoid exposure to cold situations. Using body heat, for example, putting the hands underneath the armpits, is a safe method of warming the fingers. Frequent use of gloves is important. Gloves in the glove compartment, gloves left in coat pockets, gloves on the radiator in the hall to pick up at the last minute as you leave the house, Gloves always available should the need arise. Electrically heated socks and gloves are useful. Sometimes they can be a little cumbersome. Silver gloves layered underneath thicker thermal gloves are useful as the silver reflects heat back into the hands and also has antibacterial properties. Feet and hand warmers can be useful. Disposable types such as Mycol can be bought online and kept in a pocket or a handbag until they're required. They come in a foil package and heat up on shaking and stay warm for a few hours. They are discarded after a single use. Reusable types can often be a more reasonable option. These are fluid-filled pouches containing a metal disc. To activate, the disc is clicked and heat spreads through the pouch. These too stay warm for a few hours but require boiling and cooling before they can be used again. 
more recently, rechargeable electric hand warmers, hot rocks, which are charged through the USB port of a PC, have become available. These allow instant heat at the keyboard and can be detached and carried in the pocket. Old-fashioned charcoal and lighter fuel hand warmers are still available. Natural remedies may prove helpful in controlling the symptoms of Raynaud's. There are some supplements to the diet which promote warm hands such as fish oil, ginkgo biloba, evening primrose oil and vitamin E. There is, however, not much evidence backing up use of these products. Spices such as ginger and cinnamon, cayenne pepper and mustard may have warming properties, providing overall warmth to the body. It has to be said that more studies need to be done to prove these theories, and please remember to check with your doctor or pharmacist that there's no interaction between regular medications. If the symptoms persist and you're finding it hard to keep your hands warm, especially over the winter period, then your clinician will be able to prescribe a vasodilator such as nifedipine or Adalat. This opens up the small blood vessels in order to improve the circulation to the fingers and toes. This helps to overcome exposure to the cold and preserves blood flow to the extremities. One disadvantage to taking a vasodilator is that it's not specific to the fingers and toes. Opening up all the small blood vessels in the body that can cause symptoms of headache, dizziness or nausea. Usually your clinician will prescribe a low dose to start. Some people tolerate the treatment better than others and some people build up a tolerance over a couple of weeks. It's not possible to predict how you'll you respond if you've been prescribed the treatment. The optimum treatment would be the lowest dose you can take without having any side effects. Following discussion with your GP, it may be possible to increase the dose within the prescribed amount over the winter period and reduce the dose over the summer period. If one vasodilator proves unsuitable, then further treatment options may be available which have a different mode of action. New treatments are still becoming available in Reno, such as sildenafil or Viagra. If, even with treatment, the fingers are still a problem, then it's possible for the fingers to have an Ilaprost infusion. This is usually given to those with scleroderma having particular problems with their fingers, and occasionally it's given to help get through the winter. It involves an inpatient stay on a hospital ward and patients are given a daily infusion over a period of five days. This opens up the blood vessels in the same way but also has a therapeutic effect with benefits lasting up to a few months afterwards. In the most severe of circumstances in scleroderma, a digital sympathectomy has been used to increase the blood flow stripping the blood vessels of the outside layer. This allows the blood vessels to expand and reduces the response to a cold stimulus. This is very rarely done and only by expert hand surgeons. A small amount of Botox has been injected into the artery wall to relax the muscles and try and overcome the constriction. This enables the arteries to open up and increase the perfusion to the fingers. The evidence is that this is beneficial to patients, but more studies are needed to fully appreciate the benefits that are possible. Raynaud's is not a condition that's untreatable. There are a range of different solutions available, and for many, you'll be able to self-manage your condition at home. If you'd like any further support or information about Raynaud's, managing your condition, or the best products to try, then visit the SR UK website www.sruk.co.uk.
I look forward to answering your questions from 12 to 1 p.m. today during our live chat session. If you have a question about Raynos, then you can email this to livechat at sruk.co.uk or ask me via Twitter by using our at WeAreSRUK and the hashtag LC. You can, inv you can be involved by watching the live Twitter stream below. Join us on Facebook, WeAreSRUK, or join us on Twitter. <laughs>